Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Sadaqallahul Azim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, dear brothers and sisters, alhamdulillah tonight we list, we listen to the recitation of the 14th uh, part of the Quran by our respected beloved Sheikh Ismail Isa. The theme of this uh, surah, this juz rather, this uh, juz can be that the universe calls to Allah. The universe calls to God. Bismillahi Rahmanir Rahim, Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Wa Sallallahu Alaihi Sayyidina Muhammadin Wa Alihi Wa Sahbihi Salam. So this juz covers uh, two surahs from Surah Al Hijr, the chapter of the stony ground, which refers to the area where the people of Prophet Saleh, peace be upon him, lived the people of Ad. Al-Hijr refers to the stony plain that they lived upon, the rocky plain that they lived upon. And it ends uh, with Surah Al-Nahl and around the 128th ayah of Surah Al-Nahl, which is the Surah of the Honeybee, uh, which takes its name from uh, an, ayah, an ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the honeybee and its uh, health giving liquid that comes from uh, its, its, uh, its insides. In this book, in this particular uh, surah, and in the past six surahs, the word kitab is mentioned quite a bit. Kitab means that which is written, matub. And the book here, specifically, that this juz focuses on is the book of creation, the book of the universe, what our scholars call Al-Kitab Al-Mandur, Kitab Allahi Mandur, the book of Allah that is seen, the book of Allah that is observed. Our scholars for many, many centuries have always taught that there are three books that Muslims need to learn to read that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders us iqra, to read, to recite, that we're being told to read from three books primarily. There's the book, Kitab al-Qur'an, Kitab al-Mastur, al-Furqan. There's al-Qur'an that we recite in our prayers that we have been reciting this month of Ramadan, studying this month of Ramadan. That book needs to be recited. It needs to be reflected upon. It needs to be practiced. It needs to be internalized. We need a connection with that book. And it is the book that guides to that which is most straight. In the Quran, Indeed, this Quran, this recital of scripture, it guides to that which is straightest, that which is most upright. And it is through studying of the Quran that we are able to read the second book, which is the book we're talking about tonight, the book of nature, the book of creation, the book of the cosmos. In the cosmos are many phenomena. There are many occurrences. And we can use science to try to understand some of these occurrences, some of the processes and some of the systems and the laws that govern them. But science only tells you what. It doesn't tell you why. Science only tells you how, to a degree even. But it doesn't tell you, you know, why. Science tells you, may tell you what it is that you're studying, that you're observing, but it does not tell you what it means. And so the Quran, the book of the Quran helps us to understand what the book of creation means, what it means, what's the ma'na. And then studying the book of creation as Allah teaches us to do and calls us to do in about 700 ayat of the Quran. Teach it takes us to the third book, the book of the nafs, the book of the soul, the, the self of the human being, 
in which are ayat. Allah says that there are ayat in your own souls. Don't you see? There are, there are signs in your own souls, in your own selves. Don't you see? Allah Ta'ala says we are showing them our signs upon the horizon and in their own selves, in their own souls, until it is manifestly clear to them that he is the absolute truth, that the Quran is the absolute truth, that Prophet Muhammad, God bless him and grant him peace, is the truth, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, God bless him and grant him peace. So through the book of creation, the wise contemplate, the heedless are reminded, and the ignorant are made to see. Whomever is meant to be guided will thus be guided. And whomever God's will, God wills will remain in a state of blindness and delusion. On the day of judgment, on the day of account, every group will realize that for which they strived. It is then that those who disbelieved will truly wish that they had submitted. They will have wished those who rejected God, those who rejected Allah, will wish that they had been Muslims. And they will ask Allah to return them back to this world just so that they can believe in God and follow and obey his prophets and messengers. Allah says this at the beginning of Surah Al-Hijr in the second ayah. Unfortunately for them, because of their willing blindness to the signs of God, they persist in rejection and arrogance, such that were the gates of the heavens to open up to them, and they were to ascend through them, they would just say, perhaps we have fallen prey to illusion and great trickery. They wouldn't even believe what they were beholding and perceiving and seeing. In summary, these people have turned their backs on, their, on this vast universe, whose contents speak eloquently to the, um, to the power, the omnipotence of the all-knowing creator. They have followed the devil, may Allah curse him and protect us from him, who refused to prostrate to their father, Adam, peace be upon him, and asked for a respite. The shaitan asked for a respite, not to seek forgiveness of Allah, but rather to misguide. He wanted extra time extra time to misguide Adam and his progeny. They follow the accursed devil who brings them to ruin and as a result, they disobey the merciful Lord who has only love for them. As Allah mentions in the 49th ayah of Surah Al-Hijr, the 15th chapter of the Quran, Allah only has love for them, but yet they reject him. Are they not then deserving of the fate that befell the wrongdoing folk of Prophet Lot, peace be upon him, or the oppressive Midianites, the people of Prophet Shu'ib, peace be upon him, or Thamud, the people of Prophet Saleh, who rejected the truth? So despite his people's opposition, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is still commanded to deliver the message. And this is very important for us, those of us who are involved and committed to, and really every Muslim, every Muslim should be committed to sharing the message of Islam, even if it's only through your character. And that really is the most powerful way. Not through your words, not through handing out books or sending YouTube videos to your family or your coworkers or your friends. The best way to share the message of Islam to make tabligh is through your khuluq. Well, he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Balligh anni wa law ayah, convey on my behalf, even if it's just one ayah, one verse of the Quran, all right, one sign from the Quran. Convey that verse by internalizing and embodying the verse in your actions, in your behavior. We, he is still commanded to faithfully discharge his duties and proclaim that he had been, what he had been commanded to deliver. All the while turning away from the polytheists, those who associate creation with God and who associate God with creatures 
and to worship God alone until they came to him certainty. Yaqeen. And what is certainty? Yaqeen means to worship God, worship Allah until death comes to you. Meaning, keep worshiping Allah until your last breath. Because you will be raised up how you die. And you die the way you lived. Allah says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, ittaqullaha haqqa tuqati, wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. O you who have believed, you should revere, obey Allah as he deserves to be revered. And do not die unless you are in a state of surrender to him. And so brothers and sisters, we see here, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, again, commanding us, giving stories that show that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was not alone, that there were prophets before him that were opposed by their peoples. There were prophets before him whose people claimed that their prophet was nothing but a magician. May Allah ta'ala protect us from that. that, there were pro that and that the prophets before him were given success in victory even though many of their people rejected them. Let's talk a little bit about Surah Al-Nahal in the remaining few minutes. The verses of the chapter of Nahal, the chapter of the bee, which is one of my favorite chapters of the Quran, the chapter of the honeybee, it takes up this theme by presenting a number of examples of this creation that speak to the benevolent power of the provisioning Lord. The, the, the merciful, loving power of the Lord, the master that provides for all of the creatures. He created livestock so that we can derive from them warm clothing and enjoyable delicacies, Allah mentions, and use them as beast of burdens to do, beast of burden to work thus making desirable possessions. He also, God has also fashioned the oceans that ships might, as Allah says, plow the waves and has placed therein fle flesh that is fresh and tender and, and seafood that we eat. Creation in its entirety is subject to his command. The sun, the moon, the stars, and all of these creatures have been placed in the service of humanity. Not for us to exploit them, not for us to abuse them or to mistreat them as happens in so many communities, Muslim and non-Muslim, but they are there for us to serve and to, for us to treat kindly. One of my teachers who taught us sections from Umda Tasalik or Umda Danasik, the this wonderful text in Shafi Fiqh, Ustad Amr Khalifa. Ustad Amr taught us that you should treat plants with the honor that you treat animals. And you should treat animals with the honor with which you treat human beings. And you should treat human beings that are not Muslim with the honor and compassion that you would treat Muslims with. And you should treat your fellow Muslims with the honor and compassion with which you would treat your own self. And this is a recipe for success, brothers and sisters. He raised, Allah raised the mountains and made pathways and rivers run and studded the heavens with stars. By that, by them, men might be guided. Don't all of these call to the realization that God is the creator of all and that Allah knows all things? and that those who worship other than him are in clear error. At the end of Surah Al-Nahl, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us questions and challenges. Does it befit the servant after all of this? All that's been mentioned in the surah about the pure milk that comes from between bowels and blood, a pure drink, for those who drink, about the blessings of the date palm tree, which every aspect of the date palm tree is beneficial. And the believer is like a date palm tree for this reason. Some trees can give you uh, sh shelter, 
but their fruits are poisonous. Some trees give you their fruit, but they, they can't provide you wood for furniture, for shelter, but the date palm tree, every part of it, every part of it is a benefit to human beings. And this is the likeness of the believer that the Prophet wasallam said. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the healing, the healing drink that comes from the nectar that bees take from flowers and so many other, other pairs of creation and regeneration of strength and weakness of life and death by which Allah Ta'ala makes this world so comfortable and so malleable for us to live in. Allah creates us without knowing anything. And then now look at us now. We have so much knowledge and so much power, but our knowledge and our power are nothing before the power and knowledge of Allah. Does it befit the servant after all of this that he turn away from his Lord? Did he break his agreement with Allah on the day of Alastu bi Rabbikum? On the day of Am I not your Lord? That day we made a covenant with Allah that we would live our lives as knowing that Allah is our master. And is it befitting that we betray, that we betray the solemn oath that we made to our Creator? Brothers and sisters, in conclusion, it's better that the human beings submit and repent to the one who forgives all sins, al ghafur rahim And at the conclusion, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us a similitude in the person of the great prophet, Abraham, peace and blessings be upon him, who Allah describes as ummatan. This is Allah Akbar, the one human being one human being, kana inna kana Ibrahim qanita. Ibrahim was an ummah. He was a nation. One human being who was a nation. Why was he a nation? Because his faith and because his benefit to the worlds and his example and the character that he embodied is seldom achieved except through whole nations except through whole nations. And even that, even if a whole nation came together with its virtues, it cannot attain nubuwa. It cannot attain prophethood. That is a gift that Allah gives to whichever of his servants he chooses, of which the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was its seal. But Allah says about Prophet Ibrahim, shakiran, he was grateful. And we know that Prophet Ibrahim was always grateful. He's known as the ever grateful friend of Allah, Khalilullah, the beloved friend of Allah. It's his gratitude that made him beloved to Allah. And when you and I become grateful, we enter into, we receive that love from Allah Ta'ala. In fact, it is through gratitude or the lack of that Prophet Ibrahim, peace and blessings be upon him, advised his son, Prophet Ismail, peace be upon him, to divorce one wife, right, and to keep another. Even though these, both of these women were in the same circumstances, one of them was ungrateful, ungrateful to Allah, while the other was thankful, even with the little that she had. This is how important gratitude, thankfulness was to Prophet Ibrahim salam that that is the main quality you should look for in your husband. That is the main quality you should look for in a wife. When you're looking to get married, young people, look for someone who is thankful and shows gratitude, first and foremost to Allah, before they show thanks to their parents, before they show thanks to their family or to you, look for someone who has a grateful heart to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This chapter, Surah Al-Nahal, the chapter of the honeybee, concludes by exhorting one who calls the truth to hold fast to patience and wisdom and to debate in the best manner regarding the ways of reality. Right? Imam Al-Ghazali says in his, some scholars say was his last book, Il Jamal Awam, Il Jamal Awam, 
and the ilm al-kalam, the bridling of the masses from going into the science of theology, he says at the end of that book that this ayah teaches us how to give da'wah and how to invite people to Allah. That there are some people you can only invite through wisdom. And there are other people from among humanity you can only invite to Allah through beautiful words, beautiful exhortation. And then there's another group of human beings. You can only invite them to Allah. They are only receptive to argumentation and debate, but with that which is best, with that which is most beautiful, and that which has been inspired newly by Allah Ta'ala. And that he should do this, the one calling to Allah should do this until God completes his task for him. For the wiles of the obdurate will come to no avail. Those who are stubborn, their, their tricks and plots and schemes will come to no avail in God's ultimate plan. Allah is with the people of taqwa. Allah is with the people of reverence and those who do good. May Allah Ta'ala help us to understand. May Allah Ta'ala help us to practice. May Allah Ta'ala help us to recite the Quran. And may Allah Ta'ala make this month of Ramadan sweeter and sweeter and sweeter. Insha'Allah Ta'ala, there's a question. Uh, why is there sajda in the Quran? There's sajda in the Quran uh, as, number one, a reminder for us to prostrate to Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala. And these uh, ayat of sujood are at specific places uh, in the Book of Allah. Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is reported to have said, when you prostrate, it angers and humiliates shaitan. It angers and humiliates shaitan because when he was ordered to prostrate, he did not. When he was ordered to prostrate to your father, Prophet Adam, peace and blessings be upon him, he didn't prostrate. And so when, when you hear the ayat of prostration, you should prostrate. If you're in a state of wudu, and if it's being recited by someone who is qualified to be your imam in salah, right? Otherwise, it's not, you're not obligated to make the sajda, but it's recommended. If you're not in wudu, then you should say, subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar, four times in place of the sajda until you get to a place where you can make wudu and make the sajda, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, but the ayat of sujood are very important. As I said, it's there. One of the wisdoms why it's there is to teach us obedience to Allah ta'ala. That when Allah says prostrate, we prostrate. To teach us obedience. And another question, what is the third book earlier? Yes, the third book is the book of the soul, the book of the self, the book of the nafs. There are ayat that Allah has revealed in the Qur'an, and then Allah says that there are, there are ayat that are on the horizons, and scholars like Sayyid Nursi say that these horizons include the horizon of nature, of co the cosmos, as well as the horizons of history, of human history. And Thirdly, the third book is the, uh, the, uh, are the ayat that are in the selves, that are in the souls of human beings, in the nufus. And then the last question I see here, can we please pray for the bees under attack from the new menacing murder hornets? They are one of our only precious pollinators. We should make dua. You're right, uh, Sister Maria. I was reading about this last week and watched a documentary at, on it. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, uh, it's almost as if the plagues are coming one after another. Um, and yes, we, we, inshallah, will pray for the honeybees. But I'm telling you, and I've been saying it for the past three months, it's us that's the problem. It's our behavior that is the problem. The honeybees are under attack because we, human beings, and I'm not saying that you brought the hornet the Asian, the giant hornet from Asia, to, from Japan to the United States. I'm not saying you did it, but any time we cause, so we do some injustice. Then in Arabic, the meaning of injustice is to put something where it doesn't belong. And so someone 
did that. Someone brought that bee here somehow, right? that hornet here. And if it's not controlled in the next two years, uh, the, there was an article I read in the New York Times that it would ravage the honeybee population in the United States. And if the honeybee pop population in the United States is ravaged, it will lead to drought, it will lead to famine, it will lead to starvation, it will lead to a complete disruption uh, in this country of our food supply chains, and we will become even more dependent on others. So we should know this, inshallah ta'ala. So yes, we have to change our behavior. We, should, we have to look at ourselves in the mirror. Any injustice, any unfairness in our lives, we need to stop it. We need to make tawbah. And that's, that's, that's really what we need to do. But we'll pray for the bees. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alihi wa sallam. Salam. Oh Allah, we ask that you accept this this gathering, that you make it a proof for us and not against us, that you make the Qur'an a proof for us and not against us. We ask, oh Allah, that you bless us in this month of Ramadan. We ask that you grant us success to fast its days and stand and worship during its nights, ya Allah. Oh Allah, give us discipline, give us energy, bless us in our time. Oh Allah, let our children be receptive and to the, the blessings of this month and to the, the, the worship of this month, that our grandchildren be receptive and engaged and involved. Ya Allah, we pray for Imam Suhaib Sultan, our brother, that you heal him, Ya Allah, with a healing that is quick and complete. Give him well-being, Ya Allah. Surround him with angels, Ya Allah, that strengthen his body, Ya Rabbil Alameen. O oh Allah, guide him to the remedies and the treatment that he needs, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Bless his family, Ya Allah, Sister Arshin Radia and his parents and her parents, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We pray for the healing of all of our sick and mercy upon our dead and the freedom of those who are wrongfully imprisoned. And Ya Allah, the alleviation of the pain and suffering of those who are in suffering and pain. O oh Allah, we pray for the bees of this country and the bees of this planet. Ya Allah, we ask that you preserve them. O oh Allah, we ask that you protect them from human beings, who are, Ya Allah, who have been mistreating them for years, Ya Allah, treating them like, like slaves, Ya Allah, overworking them and artificially inseminating them, Ya Allah. Forgive us for the harm that we've done and for the honey that we've eaten, Ya Allah, that is from such injustice. And we ask that you protect them from these eight giant Asian hornets, Ya Allah, and that you, uh, that you, you through your name, As-Salam, and your name, Al-Hafid, Ya Allah, that you protect the bees and all the animals that are here and all the plants. We need them, Ya Allah. We need them. You have placed them here to serve us, Ya Allah. That if they're not here, Ya Allah, then it will be, uh, it, it will be uh, a means of, uh, testing for us, Ya Allah, and we ask for your protection. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa alihi wa sallam wa sallam. Subhana rabbika rabbil aizzati amma yasifun. Salaamun ala al-mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen with the intention of acceptance. Al-Fatiha. Amen. Amen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, brothers and sisters. Assalamu alaikum.